Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Andrew Harvey. Andrew is a junior professor of African languages and the construction of knowledge in the Faculty of Languages and Literatures at the University of Bayreuth. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evidence for linguistic arts and language contact. Beginning with work on Gorwa and expanding to Ihansu and Hatsa, Andrew's work engages with the complex language situation present in central Tanzania's Rift Valley, where languages of all four of Greenberg's African language phyla are spoken and have been spoken for some time. His research foci include language contact and morphosyntax, with the understanding that any linguistic insight must be tied to the community-driven documentary record, combining and celebrating the languages, cultures, and histories of the speaker communities involved. Please join me in welcoming Andrew as he gives his talk, Words and Qualities, a survey of smallness in the Tanzanian Rift. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Anna, for that introduction. Um, today, I want to take a look at words and forms that express smallness across the languages of the Tanzanian Rift. Um, so, inspired by a handful of resemblances between words indicating smallness in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, this talk is an initial survey of the semantic field of smallness. Uh, so focusing on lexical items and morphemes expre expressing the concepts short, few, small, child, little people, as well as diminutivizing operations. So this talk will, one, identify the forms expressing these concepts in the Rift languages, two, identifying resemblances, and three, discussing whether resemblances could be due to contact, genetic inheritance, or chance and where contact is deemed possible scenarios are proposed. Finally, um, there's a bit of reflection made on the significance of qualities such as smallness, having shared terms across languages, and suggestions are made for future research. So following this introduction, I'll introduce us to the primary way in which I'll be presenting the data today, that is via this map. Next, I'll treat the semantic field of smallness, one rough meaning as a time. So we'll start with few, then we'll move to child, then short, then small, then little people, then diminutivizer. I'll then talk a little bit about the historical pathways of borrowing, and then I'll conclude. So for this talk, I've represented each of the Rift Valley languages as a point on this map, and it's my hope that this will be a useful way to visualize the distribution of forms and to identify patterns. Um, languages have been grouped according to their larger families, with each having been assigned a different shape. So languages from the Bantu family are represented by circles. Uh, so here we have the Bantu language Ihanzu, for example, and here we have the Bantu language Rangi. Cushitic languages are represented by squares. So here we have the Cushitic language Alagwa, and here we have Gorwa. And for the patterns that we're looking at today, Gorwa and Iraq pattern virtually the same. So when I say Gorwa, what I really mean is Gorwa and Iraq. Um, then we have the single languages from either larger phyla, like the Southern Nilotic language Azamjeg de Toga, um, as well as the language isolate Hadza. Um, and Sandawe, which may be a member of the larger Khoikhoi family, but at this point, who knows? Um, the small circles represent varieties of larger languages. So thanks to the work of Masele 2001, we have quite rich lexical data on many varieties of Bantu F-group languages, which we'll use in this talk. So these are all varieties of Nyaturu, for example. And here we have varieties of Nyilamba. Obviously, this approach is flawed. Languages occupy more space than these dots and are not immobile, but I hope that this is at least a more visual way to help us along in our examination today. So we'll start with words that mean few. Beginning with the Bantu languages spoken in the Tanzanian Rift, uh, we can see that all of the languages employ a form which derives ultimately from the Proto-Bantu verb form kip, to be small or to become few. Uh, the single exception being rangi, which uses uh, a form derived from the Proto-Bantu adjective to, which means little, 
small, or young. Now, when we zoom out to a larger picture of Tanzania and surrounds, we can see that Rangi is not, in fact, a massive outlier, but just the most easterly member of our sample, which employs a form derived from the Proto-Bantu To. Many other languages of the Takama branch employ a form derived from Proto-Bantu To as well. In fact, the area seems rather evenly divided bef between forms in Kep and forms in To. Further to the north, languages like Gikuyu, Rombo, and Kahe use forms derived from the Proto-Bantu Neo. Zooming back in on the Tanzanian rift and turning our attention to the languages of the South Cushitic branch of the Cushitic family, we can see that Gorwa and Alagwa employ a form derived from the Proto-West rift Naraku, which means poverty. Looking further across Cushitic, two, for example, the lowland East Cushitic languages, Afar and Oromo, spoken in northern Kenya and Ethiopia, we don't have good evidence of cognates for these forms in wider Cushitic. Note that Gorwa has a form kopa, which is a noun referring to any sort of side dish that's eaten in lean times. This is almost certainly a Bantu borrowing, which can ultimately be traced back to the Proto-Bantu form kip. Um, the remaining languages, each with representing separate phyla, all have forms which cannot be connected to the others given here. Uh, so to summarize, the Rift Valley Bantu languages employ Bantu forms, mainly from Kip, and Rangi takes a form from To. Uh, South Cushitic languages takes, take forms from Naraku, and Azamjeg, Hadza, and Sandawe each take unrelated forms. So sort of the takeaway from this survey is that the lexical material uh, for the words uh, covering the, the meaning few, it seems to be largely genetically inherited. Uh, moving now to forms covered by the meaning child, we can see that all of the Bantu languages we are focusing on have the same form one ultimately derived from the Proto-Bantu jana, meaning child. Um, this will, of course, not come as a surprise to the Bantuists here today, who will know well this widespread form. All of the Bantu languages I sampled for this talk have this form meaning child in one shape or another. In fact, it's more interesting for us if we modify our term a little bit. So instead of child, we will look at the word meaning young person or kind of infant, baby, or child. So here we have a handful of languages in the Tanzanian Rift which employ a form which I generalize as mungenya. So I put it between these tildes because it doesn't represent a reconstruction, just an archetypical form. So we can see that in the Ahi ver uh, variety of Nyaturu, we get munginya. In the Munyiganyi uh, variety of Nyaturu, we get mujimba. Uh, in Rangi, we get musinga. So I feel like all of these are somewhat similar. Um, this form where the data is available is spread rather widely throughout our region. So in Rwanda, we can see it in Kenya, Rwanda. Um, we can also see it um, in, uh, we can also see it in Bemba. We can also see it in Gikuyu in Kenya. Um, so it's spread rather widely. Uh, sort of returning back to the Rift Valley and now looking at the South Cushitic languages, I provided here the words for child or son. And I feel like if we squint our eyes a bit, we can see a resemblance with the Bantu form. But note, however, that I have not come across resemblances in Cushitic languages further afield. Azamjeg and Hadza each have different forms which cannot be linked to the others. Uh, with that said, though, the Azamjeg word for small, manang, does resemble mungenya. To summarize, then, a uh, young person or baby or infant, uh, in this case, uh, in our sample. So in Rift Valley Bantu languages, child is uniformly from jana, as it is elsewhere in Bantu. Uh, but uh, in Rift Valley Bantu, the word for baby, infant, young person is commonly a form like mungenya. Uh, South Cushitic forms for son are somewhat similar to mungenya and Azamjeg and Hadza each take unrelated forms. So the takeaway is there's possible Rift Valley Bantu South Cushitic borrowing, but um, I'm not exactly sure about the direction here. Moving now to the words which cover the meaning 
short. Um, we can see consistency in the Bantu languages of the Tanzanian rift with all of them uniformly taking forms which derive from the proto-Bantu adjectives kopi or kope, which means short. Bantu languages across the wider area also typically take this form. Uh, so we can see this division, and then there are a couple languages here that um, I couldn't uh, parse properly uh, and attribute to either group, but that might just be um, me needing a little bit more time. Um, the South Cushitic languages, uh, they take forms deriving from the Proto-West Rift, Omad. So looking to lowland East Cushitic, the word uh, in Afar for small is is uh, which is tantalizingly close. So perhaps indicating that this word has a distribution in wider Cushitic. The other rift languages of our sample each use different terms, which cannot be linked to the others. With that said, however, the Hadza word for small, omi, seems quite similar to the South Cushitic root omad, and we'll talk about that later. So to summarize, for short, um, Rift Valley Bentu universally has forms from kopi or kupi. Um, South Cushitic universally has forms from omad, which seems to have reflexes in Cushitic further afield. Asanjeg, Hadza, and Sandawe each take unrelated forms. So again, lexical material seems largely inherited in the case of short. Now, moving on to small, the forms covering this meaning present a rather more complex picture. So first, the Rift Valley Bantu languages show a split, with some forms deriving from the Proto-Bantu adjective to, which means little, small, or young, and some uh, deriving from the Proto-Bantu adjective neo, meaning small or few. In fact, a look at the Bantu languages spoken in the wider region shows us that forms derived from to tend to dominate in the southwest, whereas forms derived from neo tend to dominate in the northeast, and crucially with both forms meeting in our area. We can also see some bright red outliers here that um, form uh, their words in, again, this kip form to be small. Returning then to the Rift Valley, the forms we observe for South Cushitic bear a striking resemblance to those Bantu forms derived in Proto-Bantu Neo. Given that I could find no similar forms in the other Cushitic languages I looked at, I'll hypothesize that the Cushitic forms are borrowings from Bantu. Further, the Sandawe word for small is uh, tso to, and it's strikingly similar to other Bantu forms derived from the Proto-Bantu to. Uh, so as such, I'll posit that the Sandawe form is also a borrowing from Bantu. Uh, the forms in Azamjeg and Hadza can't be linked to either of these Bantu forms. However, looking at the Azamjeg form manang and remembering our discussion in the last section about the forms related to infant, child, and son, there does appear to be a connection between the Azamjeg word for small and these forms, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Also, and as mentioned above, the Hadza word for small bears a strong resemblance to the South Cushitic forms for short. To summarize then, most Rift Valley Bantu takes forms in to, common to the west and south. Ihanzu and the Ushola variety of Nyilamba take forms in Neo, which is common to the east and north. Uh, south Cushitic also takes a form based on Neo, and Sandawe takes a form based on to. And Manang in Asanjeg resembles the Rift Valley Bantu South Cushitic form Mungenya, small baby, etc. Um, then Hadza Umi represents or resembles the South Cushitic Umad short. So in this case, we can really characterize the situation as cross-family borrowing being quite widespread for this word for small. I'd like now to talk about little people. That is the semi-mythical group of small statured hunters 
who inhabit the legends of many of the current peoples of East Africa. This was actually the topic which sparked my interest in this larger project about small things. But from a Rift Valley perspective, it wouldn't have made a very interesting talk because as you can see, we don't actually have uh, much data for this term in any of the Rift Valley Bantu languages. When we zoom out, however, we can see two patterns emerge across the Bantu languages of the wider area. The first is composite forms, such as the Swahili term for little people, wabili kimo, which can be decomposed into bili, two, and kimo, measure. So Martin Walsh cites Johannes Rebman's etymology. So Rebman notes that they're described as being two cubits tall, so two measures tall. Walsh, and importantly for us, Walsh then notes that since chemo is an Arabic loan, then the term must be relatively new. Uh, Sukuma also has a composite word, this time one of those names formed of an entire phrase. Uh, so Iwan Bonelahe, which means where did you first see me in Sukuma? I'll mark this Sukuma form on the map, but if I were to mark the Swahili form, maybe somewhere in Zanzibar, it wouldn't do justice to the fact that Swahili is everywhere. So suffice it to say that Swahili suffuses the whole situation here when we have this term in Bilikimo. Uh, so next, and sort of more central to this talk, are the forms in other Bantu languages I've looked at. Wakoningo in uh, what was called Chaga in the, uh, in the literature I got it from, and Wakoningo in Rwa. Uh, so this is thanks to Daisuke Shinagawa for these data points. Finally, Gogo has a form in Kulimba, which if we allow for nasalization in Kilimanjaro Bantu or denasalization in Gogo, gives us a form which could be argued to be cognate across all four languages. So uh, zooming back into the Tanzanian Rift, the word in Gorwa for a small person is ni'ilo. Not a perfect candidate for cognacy with the others, but maybe if we hold our noses, uh, we might be able to admit it. Uh, finally, Tenra gives the form Nini for a clan of hunter people who once lived in the Sandawe country who were shorter and lighter in complexion. So I'll also uh, admit this to our group. Uh, so to summarize then, I would state tentatively that for little people, a regional form, but not necessarily bent to an origin, might be posited. So finally, let's turn to the diminutivizer and diminutivizing operations in the Tanzanian rift. So first, and strikingly, Rift Valley Bantu languages display two distinct patterns, not only the classic Bantu strategy of employing noun class markers to indicate the diminutive, but also a productive compounding process in which a form derived from the word for, word for child is prefixed to the noun. So in Ihanzu, the noun nyumba, house, becomes wanyumba, small house, or ananyumba, small houses. Importantly, this operation is completely productive and works for both animate and inanimate nouns. As such, uh, for the data we have, which was rather harder to come by as it's often not something we find in word lists, we can see two patterns noun class shift and compounding with a form derived from the Proto-Bantu noun jana, meaning child. I should point out that the two Bantu languages of the Rift Valley stand out in this pattern, as none of the other languages in my regional sample show this. Uh, in fact, Gibson, Guerrois, and Martin's 2017 survey shows that the nearest examples we have of the same pattern is in Chihuabo, spoken in Mozambique, and in Zadi, spoken in Western DRC, each over 15,000 kilometers away. But I guess that this is more a reflection of the state of description of Bantu languages than an actual gap. Returning to the other languages of the Tanzanian Rift, the South Cushitic languages employ gender shift for individuation, but not strictly for diminution. Uh, I have no data for Azenjeg. Uh, Sandawe, however, features two strategies for diminution one which involves shifting the gender of the noun from masculine to feminine, which is similar enough to the Bantu strategy that I'll make it the same color. And the second strategy is a genitive construction indicating daughter of, as can be seen in the example here. So a small hole in this case is literally daughter of a hole. Uh, 
on first brush, one may be tempted to code this as the same as the compound forms used in Ihanzu and Yaturu, but grammatically they're rather different. And either way, this diminutivizing strategy is so common cross-linguistically that the resemblance between the two is most probably due to chance. Finally, Hadza employs two diminutivizing strategies. The first is a nominal suffix, and the second is a verbal suffix, and we'll talk about both. So the nominal suffix attaches to a noun and renders it diminutive. So the noun ola, child, becomes ola nakwe, little child. Uh, the verbal suffix renders one of the arguments of the verb diminutive. Compare then Kirk Miller's example, hakamo, it went, and hakag. Wait, let me get the pronunciation right. Hakagiamo, it went, where the thing going is small. Uh, neither of these two forms fit within the current patterns mapped. With that said, however, let us consider the Cushitic connection. We'll remember that the Proto-West Rift Cushitic form naraku means poverty. Uh, this certainly resembles this nominal suffix. Next, the ka'i verbal suffix resembles the form onkmad short. With that said, however, this form is reconstructed from one adjectival form in each of the South Cushitic languages, whereas in Hadza, we seem to have a cluster of forms. So we have a'e, young, omi, little and small, a'e, a bit of. This, to my mind, suggests that the direction of boring may be the other way around. Uh, so to summarize then, most Rift Valley Bantu languages form the diminutive by shifting a noun's class, uh, and Ihanzu and Yaturu employ a compound with the form jana. Um, and this is uh, not incredibly rare typologically, uh, not unheard of in Bantu, but in our sort of uh, neighborhood, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been, to this point, it's been undocumented. Uh, and then Sandawe employs two strategies, switching the gender of the noun, so feminine gender makes something small, or employing this daughter of genitive construction. Hadza features two diminutivizing morphemes, one nominal and one verbal. Both have possible cognates in South Cushitic. So the takeaway from the diminutivizer is, in the case of Sandawe and Rift Valley Bantu, the shared strategies are so common the resemblance is probably due to chance. Uh, there is possibility uh, there is possibly Hadza South Cushitic borrowing, though again, uh, the direction of which is a question mark. Uh, so having reviewed these meanings and the words that express them in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, I'd like now to take a closer look at the words which we noted as resembling each other and work out possible connections. So let us first take a look at the case of, of Sandawe Tso To resembling the Proto-Bantu to, uh, Bastin et al. 2002 in the BLR3 proposed four derived forms from the basic Proto-Bantu form, and these are given here. Um, clearly, the topmost form, a reduplicated redu adjective, to, to, best resembles the Sandawe form. Um, However, this con the contemporary forms in neighboring languages don't resemble this form in any sort of straightforward way. Perhaps the closest is the gogo -go form, but this is almost certainly descended from the voiced, short, voweled form that's uh, proposed by Bastin et al. As such, we may have to posit that the Sandawe form was borrowed directly from this archaic form. This, however, would require us to ask questions not only about time depth, but also about what the predecessors of current-day Bantu languages in the area sounded like in the past. The next resemblance is that of the Proto-Bantu adjective neo and the Proto-West Rift Cushitic adjective ninao, both meaning small. Again, the BLR proposes two derived forms, nini and nono. Um, rather unhelpfully, the contemporary forms located most closely to present-day South Cushitic show no clear path backwards, uh, with the vowel, with the vowels not matching well. So the specific question is how the proto-Northwest Rift Cushitic form acquired the rounding at the end. Uh, it's also true that the two languages, Ihanzu and the Ushola variety of Nilamba, 
represent an island of forms derived from the Proto-Bantu Neo and a larger sea of forms derived from the Proto-Bantu To. Could, therefore, it be that the Cushitic languages acquired the form from the northern Bantu languages where Neo is uh, more prevalent and that this form was then borrowed into Ihanzu and Ushola from the Cushitic languages? Um, I'll leave that for your consideration. The resemblance between Proto West Rift, the Proto West Rift noun Naraku, meaning poverty, and the Hadza nominal diminutivizer Nakwe is also worth looking at more closely. So the, th the South Cushitic forms given in this talk thus far are the Gorwa adjective Narak, meaning few, and the cognate in Alagua Naragu, meaning the same thing. I'm familiar with a couple other forms from my own notes in Gorwa, the noun narkusmo, which means poor person, and the adjective ninak, rather less common in my corpus than narak, but also meaning few. First, it should be noted that all of these forms, except for ninak, we can identify ar, which might be a habitual morpheme in Cushitic, or in South Cushitic at least. This may leave us with a smaller form, nak which suddenly looks very much like the Hadza diminutivizer, but whose semantics are altogether more cryptic. Was this form borrowed into Hadza from Cushitic? Or was, uh, given that we see no cognates in wider Cushitic, was this form borrowed into Cushitic from Hadza or a Hadza predecessor language? Again, I'll leave that for your consideration. The resemblance between the proto-Southern Cushitic adjective on omad, meaning short, and the verbal diminutive morpheme in Hadza, ai, is also an interesting case. First, as mentioned above, Hadza actually has a set of seemingly cognate forms, giving a wide, wider range of meanings. Compare this to the three Cushitic forms, which are all adjectives, and they all mean the same thing, short. With that said, there exists in the lowland East Cushitic language Afar the adjective oncha, meaning short, which is a very good candidate as a Cushitic cognate. So was the form borrowed into Hadza from South Cushitic? Was the form borrowed from Hadza or a Hadza predecessor into South Cushitic, possibly wider Cushitic? Is the Afar word just a chance resemblance? Or maybe the word was borrowed into both uh, Proto-Southern Cushitic and Hadza from uh, a third language, perhaps one of the elusive early East African languages presented at this webinar series last year by Mauro Tosco and Bonnie Sands. Finally, and perhaps most abstractly, I would like to talk about the cluster of words and meanings that group around the archetype of nasal vowel nasal sequence, where the final nasal has the feature plus velar. These would include the South Cushitic forms for sun, nang, and ning, or nung, uh, and also the azamjeg adjective meaning small, manang. Uh, this is also the core of the form uh, that was identified for child, infant, and baby, mungenya, uh, for which we see forms in Ihanzu, so mungenya, nyaturu, munginya, uh, and kinyarwanda, uruhinja, among others. Uh, but uh, it's not the only form. Uh, this is also the form common to nouns referring to those semi-mythical little people across East Africa, this kuningo, uh, the Wakoningo of Chaga, the Wakoningo of Roa, and the Nkulimba of Gogo, as well as the Ni'ilo of Gorba and the Nlini of uh, Sandawe. And now to conclude. Though starting from a rough, or so through starting from a rough semantic field, and having, uh, and having to do with smallness, this talk has examined similarities and differences between a group of languages from different genetic groupings in how they express and encode smallness. Additionally, some assessment has been made regarding whether forms were borrowed and the possible direction for borrowing. So other, overall, we found that few and short are mainly genetically inherited, whereas child and especially small feature extensive borrowing. 
little people may have a regional form, and then there's considerable Hadza and South Cushitic shared forms. Uh, that's probably the most diplomatic way to put it. Uh, to finish then, I'd like to think about these two, first two patterns, namely that the words expressing the meanings few and short were not typically borrowed, but the words expressing the meaning small and child were widely borrowed. I titled this talk Words and Qualities, first of all, as a direct reference to the words and things approach. So an approach in historical linguistics, which posits that if a term for something existed or could be reconstructed in a lingua culture, then that thing must have existed in that lingua culture. This was and is an alternate approach as well as a complementary tool to the practice of identifying regular sound correspondences. But what I've looked at today was not words and things, but words and qualities. Not only qualities, but a quality, smallness, that is so universal that it leads us to a question. Why borrow words for smallness? I have our colleague Christian Rappold to thank for an essential insight into this because in a discussion from several months ago, he suggested something that I've been thinking about ever since, and that is endearment. So often, among the suite of terms that we use to show affection, the semantic field of smallness is present and heavily exploited. Further, referring to an object of affection, evocations of smallness or cuteness or childlike qualities are often used. This is in contrast to concepts such as few or sparseness or shortness, though the American English term shorty for a girlfriend is an exception here. <laughs> and these terms of endearment Crossing linguistic boundaries can be well documented, even in a cursory examination of contemporary pop culture. So Latina singer Camila Cabello loves being affectionately called the Spanish diminutive senorita. Closer to the rift, artist Mario sings in Swahili, but his object of affection is called chibonge, clearly recognizable as the class seven noun class prefix, but also clearly borrowed from another Bantu language. The scenario I'd like to propose is one of Bantu-speaking people being incorporated into especially Cushitic-speaking, but also Sandawe-speaking communities. Bantu-speaking women marrying into Cushitic and Sandawe communities and being called small as a term of endearment, or calling their own children small as a term of endearment in their first, which are Bantu languages, and then the term being generalized to all small things. Or and Bantu-speaking mothers raising children in non-Bantu-speaking communities, calling their children as a form of endearment, calling their children, babies, and young people child in their first Bantu languages. So essentially, rather than a story of introduction of new things into a lingua culture, the set of borrowings seems rather to attest to the slow, intimate transformation of existing concepts in a lingua culture via the mechanics of marriage, childbirth, and yes, love and affection. Uh, so thank you, that is my talk. And uh, I'm going to slowly scroll through the data sources with page references for anybody who would like it. And I'll end with my references. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, Andrew. So we can start right away with the question and answer section. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded. So anything you ask will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. During the presentation, I already saw that I think Lizzie Poole had a comment. She said that Rangi also has K for few. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Lizzie. And then I see that Helen has raised her hand. So let's see. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I was frantically scribbling and looking things up at the same time at some point, so I may have missed this. But um, did you have the Sandawe word for famine, which is naragu? No, I didn't have the mm. Sandawe form for famine, and that is uh, a okay. great addition, naragu. Okay, great. good. That was one. And then the other one was about uh, the... But I have a the... question for you, Helen, oh, before you start. Oh this okay. this this naragu, does yeah. that does that feel Sandawe to you? 
Well, that's a question for Ed and Bonnie. Um, but <laughs> okay. I have I have to say I haven't found it with the tone. I've only found it in the translation work. So I have, yeah, I have some questions myself. So okay. <laughs> don't know okay. if they want to jump in. Um, yeah, but if not, I'll my my second point was um the to to um that do you find it in at least a couple of other words uh ma do meaning few and we do meaning narrow um so the mm. we ma and to are verbs so to be oh. narrow to be few to be small and then that do is is a suffix so it's I morphologically have complex mm, okay yeah. well that is probably a count against the whole word being a boring, but the to is interesting for being small. But it, yeah, it's even closer to what you were saying is the original form. So yeah, yeah. Then we don't need to worry about that reduplicated form. Also. Yeah, but it's, as far as I understand it, it's not. It's uh, but I mean, it is very limited. It's on the word for few and the word for narrow. I'm not sure if it's anywhere else. Those are the only oh, ones I found. This is great, though. Both of those semantically are very uh, are very close. I never mm. thought about uh, narrow or skinny. That might be another thing to uh, to incorporate into this list. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Thanks. Oh gosh, this is this is great extra extra stuff, uh, Helen. Thank you for that. Sorry, I, I have uh, Helen's problem of looking things up while people are talking, so I may miss something. But Sandalwe also has this word for fledgling or little chick. It's a pong. That's uh, Tucker, Brian, and Woodburn. I also cited in Dump Wolf. Oh, like that. Mm. I'm trying to and think. And I, def I defer to Ed on the Naragu, but I would look to the Tog for that personally. That. Mm. So uh, I guess if, if no one else has a question, I have a general comment, which is, you're talking about borrowings potentially, but I'm wondering what role there might be for a multilingual influence that isn't borrowing. That mm -hmm. is, we know those people have a word that sounds like this for words meaning small. We have choices in our language. We have different synonyms, and maybe you choose one more than the other because it resembles a neighbor's word. A little bit. I'm wondering about the Nakwe and Hadza. So we have a verb in Hadza, Naku, meaning to gather. Now, there is something about it. it I mean, that Nakwe is very often in the Nie Nakwe, like my my little child, right? Yep. And it's almost like a an associative in a way. It it is an endearment, but it it could also be something like an associative. You know, those who belong together with me or something. I don't know. I mean the the que certainly resembles the qua um, first person possessive in a way. Yeah. Um, and you've got knee words like nita, sibling in law, nie for a sibling. Um, Th um, this is, Bonnie, I think where we get even more um, abstract, but also kind of it begins to hit more things. But this nasal high vowel or this nasal velar thing going on you then begin to hit things like kinship terms in other um in other languages so the word for one of the kinship words for mother in um ihanzu is nina um there's a lot of this kind of stuff in um in the bantu languages nearby but in general i mean the word for small ni a lot of a lot of this stuff but of course then we're then we're going down to just a couple of sounds, which which becomes a bit yeah. More but I wonder to what extent, you know, you might just change the the phonemes in a in a word just to make them sound better, <laughs> more like, mm -hmm. you know, the just the yeah. Kind is of there a, any sort of sound analogical here? can uh, just a, a, you know I don't I don't know examples from English etymology off the top of my head, but where you know you actually change the sound because it other words in the neighborhood, you make it sound more like them. Martin maybe has one. Uh, he just raised his hand. So I'll let Martin talk. I, I have something else. Uh, so uh, go ahead. You know, I have, I have, uh, I'm fascinated by the compounding in, uh, in Nihanzu with mm. the child plus the noun. Mm. To me, it's very strange because uh, usually the compounds, the first element, I mean, in, in the, in the Bantu languages, would be the head, 
And so the the the, the Muara Sharia is 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 a child of law, so he's he's a person. Uh and it wouldn't mean small. And and in other languages you get uh, bull child to mean the small bull, but then child is at the end and, and not and not as first element of the compound. So I'm 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 really sort of yeah, taken aback by this order of the of the compound in uh, in Yaturu and in uh, Nihanzu. I I should say also interestingly, like when you when you make these forms and then when you make agreement with them, they then agree in class one and two. They know so house okay. here is class nine, but then when you have a little house, it now agrees in class one, just like okay, just like a child. So, so it suddenly it is becomes. The head. It is yeah, the head. yeah, yeah, syntactically, it's the head syntactically there. is the head. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I wonder whether that's then a calc from Sandawe, where you had daughter of. Okay. That they just copied the structure, but I find the structure very odd in the whole in the in 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 among the Bantu languages of this area. It'd be worthwhile for us to go back and to look at those other couple handful of cases that use this kind of diminutive in the other Bantu languages and to see, to look at the headedness, to see what the agreement patterns are. Did they do the same thing as Ihanzu and uh, and this variety of new and, um, and Yaturu? Or uh, do they retain the agreement class of their, uh, of their original, uh, the original noun? Yeah. Uh, I well, I don't. Just a few cases that I know by heart are in the Chaga languages where you have Njekwana from Jeku Ana, mm -hmm. and there the agreement is is to the Njeku to the to the bull and mm -hmm. not not to the child. Is it productive in in Ihanzu? Oh yeah, that they don't use class switching at all. You can use it for everything and anything. Okay. Yeah. And do you know about Nyaturu? Yeah, Turu, I have uh, the data was in Olson's grammar. Right. And it was, that's the diminutive, and it was the same pattern as the Ianzu. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Nilamba data, I believe that it was a, which is interesting because usually it's Nilamba and Ianzu will mm -hmm. pattern together. Um, oh, I, uh, yeah. gosh. Um, usually those two languages will pattern together and the other one, you stop it and the other ones will, uh, and the other ones will pattern separately. So, uh, so Nyilamba, do you know what it does? Nyilamba. Yeah. Nyilamba uses a noun class switch, okay, 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 uses okay. a noun class switch. So yeah. Nyilamba uses, well, at least the variety of, of Nyilamba here uses a 12, 13. Hmm. Yeah. So nothing too out of the Helen put in the chat that um, Moana Kondo in Swahili for lamb is a common pattern in Bandu languages of Arnbea. The Moana and then the... Yeah. But also like, yeah, like Moana Simba. You get that. Yeah, but that could be that literally two... the child of the Simba. That yeah. can either be a child of Simba or it could be probably more common in Tanzania is a, a fan of the Simba Sports Club, yeah. Oh yeah, it's just another, <laughs> which is not what we're looking. At. So do, would you have that Helen in the Mbea languages area also for things? So like here we have it for house. No, the difference it's only for, for like Inyan Kuku for um, chicks and or Utuan Kuku, um, yeah, animals, birds, but but the same kind of. Um, no no connective structure yeah yeah it's a real compound but the first one it is still a child i mean the the monarch yeah world. yeah it's still a moana in some sense it's an animate thing animate. so it's it's still i mean the head is still the first element well i was trying to think about that for the agreement um i'm not sure and i'm not sure if all the languages do the same thing there because i I've, I've definitely come across like a um some with a class nine, a sort of inyana, and some definitely using class uh, 13 for plural, utuanang, kuku, or something. Um, but I couldn't give you specific languages. I'm probably mixing up a couple in those mm -hmm. examples. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And yeah, and then how they work with agreement, I'm not sure I've seen them in context where I'd be sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. When it comes to the terms of endearment, um, I think these tend to be lexical items which might not be part of vocabularies or dictionaries. Like, do you have an overview in this area? How people use terms of endearment and how they are formed? I think this would be so cool <laughs> to do. I think that this would be incredible, and this is where I'm. This is where we're missing uh, Alice Mitchell in the room, uh, because I think it would be something that she would be so good at doing, because uh, she's done stuff that's so similar to it. But I mean, it couldn't be. I think it'd be really fun research to do, actually, to figure out how people, how pe what people call their their bows. Yeah, I was just thinking about Iraq, where for children sometimes you get the Ako and the Ama, which are of course just a grandmother, grandfather kind of terms. So I was just yeah. wondering if you've maybe seen forms with the diminutive or with those kind of. Uh... But again, a nice, uh, a nice sort of thematic area for documentation and research that we could do. I think it would be. You could ask anybody. I mean, everybody would have a form that they would be able to, uh, you know, volunteer. Chats. Um, from Aaron, quick comments about um, Billy Kimo. My dad used to say chemo um, is from the fingertips to the elbow. It's a cubit in if you were to be a biblical or old old timey person from from right here to right here. So the assumption that Rebman made is that these in Billy chemo are two cubits tall. So two two measures. Um, but of course, what's what what's interesting for our purposes is that like, yeah, if chemo is Arabic, if that's an Arabic loan then it can't be that old, you know, it can't be too, too old of a term. Uh, so, yeah, I, I find that interesting that there's this sort of new way of calling these, these semi-mythical people. I mean, I've heard the term re referred to, you know, people who aren't semi-mythical either, but I, you know, that's another discussion. Um, but it is very interesting. I mean, everything that you read about the little people um, every every group says, well, when we got here, there were little people. If there wasn't another group of contemporary people around, there are these little people and we chased them away. Or they, you know, they took us underground and things. But I mean, we have stories about this at home as well. Little people that can lead you astray. You know, uh, so I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting thing that they would all be called the same thing, unless there was a real sense that we're talking about, you know, whether real or fictive, uh, an, an ethnic group, you know, because then they would be, if there was a one word for them, it would be, that would be the word that you use, right? So I don't know. Uh, and I haven't been able to break it down, this word for little people. Uh, I haven't been able to break it down anymore, but um, Which one? this, um, let me see if I can find it, Martin. This um, uh, Wakoningo. Oh yeah. This Wakoningo, or in the um, in the Gogo and Kulimba, right? So this ko strikes me a little bit as maybe a class fifteen, and then you get this ningo being some sort of verb. Maybe I don't. Oh, do you want to join in on this discussion? Thanks. <laughs> there were. People passing, so I muted. Uh, I've uh, so with regard to the little people, these are all tales. These are older stories, presumably. Do you have any? Um, not do people have knowledge, and do they pass on stories about little people uh, contemporaneously? Like in in modern stories, uh, is that passed on to children, as far as you know, or is that kind of an ancient thing now? We need to be careful about the little people. Because there's little people in, I have the sense at least, there's little people in in people's stories about the past here. Mm -hmm. So old or people who are projecting a past back, because I mean, the best that we have are the oldest records, right? Right. Um, so we have these stories that these people were here, but then it starts to shade a little bit into modern and contemporary stories and these little people will make an appearance as well and sometimes these little people 
will exist. So these Bakuningo, as they're called, or Wabilikimo, will exist in stories that are clearly from the Brothers Grimm. So I had somebody tell me, I'm going to tell you an old Gorwa story, and it was seven, it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I said, where did you learn this one? And, and they said, we learned it at school. Ah. Um, so uh, this would be what I think somebody like Vancina would call contamination, yeah? Even though, I mean, it's not really contamination in any sense. It's it's an enrichment in some regards. Yeah. But the, the word is the same. I mean, people saw the seven dwarves and they said, oh, we have these guys. And they just okay. bought them out. Interesting. Nice. Okay. Thanks. If there's no further comments or questions, I think I'll call it for today. So no things. All right. Uh, then I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the YouTube page, and the entries for each presentation are also added to the bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 6th of March, uh, presented by DJ Desmoulins and uh, Alain Guillot, and it's titled New Insights in Hatsa Phonetics and Phonology. Uh, and then it just trusts me to thank Andrew again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.